Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. I'm Patrick, and this is officially the All-Star break. And I just got to say, after 37 games, I'm really going to enjoy this break. I told myself at the beginning of the season that, heck, why not? I love the Warriors. I missed Warriors basketball. Why not do a podcast episode for every game? along with a weekly episode where I talk to Vu Bang or Aram in Toronto or Chung or anyone else. But what I didn't expect was for the games to be so compacted and to have the games come so quickly and so often. So it's been kind of intense. So I'm going to take some time and enjoy that. Anyway, that's all the talking about myself I'll do. So 37 games in, the Warriors are 19 and 18. And they're officially still mediocre. (laughs) This game against the Suns that they lost, they got blown out. I'm guessing Steve Kerr knew that he wasn't going to play Steph or Draymond, that he was just going to send them home. And he had circled the Portland game as a gettable game, which I had done as well, which most people should do. And that's why he went all in on it, but they still lost. That's why he limited Wiseman's minutes to like 11 because he wasn't playing well, and Steve Kerr really, really wanted that win. So this Phoenix game, James Wiseman started, Nico Mannion started, Jordan Poole showed out, he had 26 points. Let's start with Jordan Poole. I've been totally down on Jordan Poole, and, you know, I'm still down on him. It's one game, I give him props, and don't get me wrong, I want him to be good. I want him to be able to replace Brad Wanamaker in the lineup who I'll get to a little bit later. And he shot well. He bombed a couple three-pointers from pretty far out, which I was impressed by. He definitely has more confidence. Question is, can he do it more consistently? And can he keep bringing it? Can he do it on the defensive end? And in the offseason, can he bulk up a little bit? That might help him play D against some of these bigger, stronger dudes as well. If he can do half of what he did tonight on a regular basis, if he can be consistent and keep the ball moving and be a threat, then I'm happy. Nico Mannion actually is my guy. I've been on Nico Mannion Island since the day he was drafted. He's actually, in my mind, a better longer-term prospect for a backup point guard. I mean, out there, he just looks the part. I've always said he has a great feel naturally as a point guard, makes the right play. He hit a few threes, missed the rest of his shots, but hey, that's fine in a game like this. But the guy looks like he belongs. And not everybody believes that. Hey, maybe in the future they're imagining a second unit backcourt of Nico Mannion and Jordan Poole. At their best, each of those guys can shoot. And at their best, each of those guys can play on ball. The defensive end for them, that's the question mark. Nico Mannion, he really puts the effort in. He didn't look like he got abused too badly. Jordan Poole, his defense in general, his history of defense, not so hot, but... I'm leaving the door open. On that note, I hate to keep piling on Brad Wanamaker, but man, he is just so uninspiring out there. I mean, he's not shooting well. We all know that. His defense is supposedly what is great about him, and that's fine. But man, he's just so rough to watch on offense. The dude got swatted on the baseline by Cameron Payne. Yes, Cameron Payne. Okay, Cameron Payne has worked his way back into the league after his short career in Oklahoma City as Russell Westbrook's dance partner. But still, it's not like that dude is this defensive stalwart. I was like, oh man, that's it was just insult to injury. I mean, he clearly won't be on the team next year. And I think maybe in the second half of the season, they'll probably, they'll give him minutes still, but they'll start phasing in the younger guys to see what they got. Now, James Wiseman got the start and he looked pretty mediocre. I mean, he'd gotten tossed around by Enos Cantor in Portland the night before. And in this game, DeAndre Ayton just looked like a grown man next to Wiseman. I mean, they're both huge, but the way they played, the way they carried themselves. At the beginning of the season, I thought Wiseman was just going to be a more athletic center than Ayton. And he still is technically, but just lately, Wiseman, he just gets pushed off his spots so much. I believe in the kid, but... You could even see on offense, Wiseman would try some post moves and he could neither get around nor move 
DeAndre Ayton. It was really weird to see because, like, he just looked like somebody who was trying things against a wall. I mean, he was 5 for 14, 11 points, 11 boards. But that's the thing. A lot of his boards were in garbage time where he didn't have to fight for them. It was just loose balls. He had some bad hands moments again, and he just gets easily moved. He's got to learn to take that contact and really, really fight through it. I said in the previous episode, he needs more dog in him, and he absolutely does. He has to look at that ball as like someone trying to take his lunch, you know? He has to fight for it. Again, that may come from the fact that he hasn't played much in the last year and a half. When you're lifting weights and doing drills and playing pickup, you're not fighting that hard in pickup. Like people aren't going full throttle physicality. They're just running. You're not getting that intense game situation where people are physically pushing and fighting and clawing. It'll come in time. But, you know, we see how far he has to go. I feel like at the beginning of the season, he looked good because of the team and the whole league was just discombobulated in this quick turnaround and teams that hadn't played together like the Warriors, they were just all over the place. But then as the Warriors figured things out, the veterans got more comfortable and Wiseman couldn't lean on that. You know, he couldn't lean on past experiences as the season went on. The veterans could. They just needed to get used to the system. They're like, oh, okay, this is the system now, I guess. For Wiseman, it was like, oh, uh, this is the system. Whoa, this is crazy. I've never done this before. So as everyone else's learning curve flattened, his remained very, very steep. And he was getting abused by a lot of veteran moves. There was one play where Devin Booker drove into the lane, hesitated a little bit, kept his dribble, and then DeAndre Ayton just basically pushed Wiseman out of the way. He cleared out the lane, and Booker just went in for an easy layup. While running back on defense on Suns fast breaks, Chris Paul actually chased James Wiseman. Tricky, savvy move, but he was chasing him to kind of use him almost as a screen or to maybe try to draw a foul on him. He was like running behind James Wiseman, and Wiseman was actually looking like he was trying to get away from him at a couple points. And this just is part of the reps, getting the reps. And that's what he needs. By the way, I just got to say, even though I've never been a huge fan of Bob Fitzgerald, he and Kalena Azubuki are growing on me a little bit. That might be a controversial statement. I don't know. But when Bob Fitzgerald busted out the banana in the tailpipe joke, that was awesome. I was like, that is fantastic. He lost points with me when he said it was from trading places because it's clearly from Beverly Hills Cop, another great Eddie Murphy movie. I don't know if younger folks got that, but that is one of the greatest movie quotes of the 1980s. I also wonder if this is going to be like the saddest all-star game ever. Obviously, people like Giannis and LeBron have already talked about how they don't think the all-star game should be happening and don't really want to go. It's going to be all the events in one evening, the dunk contest, the game, the three-point shootout. And for an event that literally just feeds on and relies on fans, what's it going to be like? Literally, it's going to be more so than any regular season game. They're just going to be performing because the All-Star game is just pure entertainment, purely for the fans. They're just going to be entertaining for no one. There's no crowd. (laughs) There's no one to vibe off of. Is it just going to be the players and the coaches? Like when someone in the dunk contest throws something crazy down that we've never seen before? Are they just going to applaud (laughs) politely? (laughs) Something that would normally bring the house down. It's going to bring down a house of like 30 people. (laughs) I'm going to tune in because I just like seeing the oddity of it all. I hope Steph wins a three-point shootout. I mean, that three-point shootout lineup is pretty solid because it's made up of a bunch of the all-stars. The dunk contest, not so much. I've only heard of Obi Toppin. (laughs) I don't know the other two dudes. It's a shame that Zion Williamson isn't going to be in it. If he's not doing it now, I doubt he ever will, unless the game is in New Orleans. Well, I hope you enjoy the break as well. That is another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter at Patrick Epino, E-P-I-N-O, or at Oakland Warriors. Check us out OaklandWarriors.com, and be sure to tell your fellow Warrior fan friends to tune in. 
The Oak Warriors podcast is produced by National Film Society. And you can also check us out on YouTube at youtube.com slash National Film Society. That's it. Music in this episode provided by Paper Sun. Special thanks to Paul Amardo for production support. See you next time, and go Dubs. <laughs>